Good morning <clears throat> and welcome back to the Monday study group. Let's begin our time together today with prayer. We offer to you, God, ourselves. You know us thoroughly and you love us. Nothing is hidden from you and we're thankful that we can be ourselves before you, with you, confident in your love and forgiveness and promise of renewal. So guide us this morning as we study in the book of Acts that what you want to teach us may come home to us and that we might live the truth that we come to understand. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are finishing up the season of Epiphany soon. Uh, this coming Sunday is the last Sunday in Epiphany. Ash Wednesday this year falls on the same day as Valentine's Day, the 14th of February. During uh, a moment in our worship service yesterday, it was actually during the annual meeting, one of the members of the congregation jokingly asked the rector, if he was going to impose ashes on our foreheads in the shape of a heart, uh, which got a hearty laugh from the congregation. And our rector Paul said, no, actually, I'll just keep using the shape of the cross. And so that's coming up uh, in what, just over, well, in, uh, less than a week, about 10 days, given that this is the 5th of February, so nine or 10 days until... Ash Wednesday. We are in Acts chapter 25 today. Paul has been kept in captivity for the last two years in Caesarea Maritima, a beautiful coastal city on the north coast of Israel. And there has been a change of governor. Felix, the previous governor, who did not govern well and with whom the majority Jewish population in Judea and Galilee uh, had a very difficult time. And so Festus, the new governor, Portius Festus, of whom we know not very much, uh, not even from Tacitus, the Roman historian, or from Josephus, the Jewish historian. But he comes to take the place of Felix as the governor of the area. And almost immediately after arriving in Caesarea, which is his, the capital of his governing territory, he decides to go to Jerusalem to seek um, conciliation, a reconciliation, um, a good relationship, let's just say, with the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem. They have the most power other than the Romans, and they've been offended over the last few years by the reign of Felix, and so Festus go, is going to try to smooth things over to make amends and to have a good relationship with the Jewish authorities. And this chapter seems to point that out, that he was uh, quite willing to appease the Jewish authorities with regard to Paul's case. So Paul has been uh, left over for two years in imprisonment, uh, free to have his friends come and go and supply his needs, but other than that, in confinement. So Festus arrives in Judea uh, after having come to Caesarea. He goes uh, from Caesarea, his capital, to Jerusalem to meet with the Sanhedrin. And they gave a report as a part of what their conversation included. They gave a report against Paul. And they appealed to Festus that he grant them a favor to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem. This will come up again in the chapter later on when 
Paul decides that's not what he wants to have happen. Apparently, Luke knows that there is still this plot to assassinate Paul if he should travel between Caesarea and Jerusalem. Maybe that same 40 people who dedicated themselves to killing Paul uh, have still maintained their uh, plot conspiracy to do Paul in, even though, of course, they've given up their not eating or drinking until they kill Paul. They'd be have starved themselves to death by now. So they were planning to ambush Paul along the way, but Festus replied that he was going to keep Paul in Caesarea and that if the Jewish authorities wanted to press charges against Paul, they would come down from Jerusalem and go up to Caesarea to the north. And if there is anything wrong about this man, you can accuse him there. I'm not sure yet whether Festus knew the nature of the charges that would be brought against Paul. If he had known them, I'm not sure he would have consented to have this trial continue, but we'll, we'll see more about that as the chapter goes on. And so he stayed in Jerusalem eight to ten days, Luke says, which surprised me. I think that's a rather long time, but again... He's in the place where most of the trouble during Felix's reign has occurred, and he wants to make sure that he establishes a strong and good relationship with the Sanhedrin in, and the high priest and his family in Jerusalem. So he spends the eight to ten days there and then goes back to Caesarea and ordered Paul to be brought, and apparently those who had charges to make against Paul went also from Jerusalem back to Caesarea. And they surrounded him, it says in verse 7, and brought serious charges against him, which Luke says they could not prove, which seems to mean that they had no witnesses to present. Those who had made the original accusations were Jews from Asia, if you remember, and they appear to have gone back home and are not the ones bringing charges now against Paul. What the exact nature of these charges was is not entirely clear, but it just says that they brought charges against him which they couldn't prove, and Paul simply says in his defense, one sentence. He does not go into a long and detailed apologia or defense, <clears throat> as we read <clears throat> in chapter in previous chapters, chapter 24, for example, he had a long defense of himself against Felix. But he simply says here one sentence, I have in no way committed offense either against the law of the Jews which he as a Pharisee would know quite well, or against the temple, which he did not desecrate by bringing Gentiles into the temple. That's an unproved accusation. Nor have I said anything against Roman law or the emperor. That of one sent this, these charges are completely false, Paul says, and that's all I need to say. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, because he wanted to restore right relationships with the Jewish authorities, asked Paul, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and be tried there before me on these charges? It didn't take long, Paul, to answer no. I am appealing to the emperor's tribunal, and this is where I should be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, and he says to Festus, as you very well know, uh, all of these charges are trumped up charges against Paul uh, that have no basis in fact. And there are no witnesses to provide evidence against Paul. They're simply outrageous charges. So Paul appeals to the emperor. 
And he says, if I am in the wrong and have done something for which I deserve to die, I'm not trying to escape death, but I am trying to get justice. If there's nothing to the, their charges against me, well, no one can turn me over to them. I appeal to the emperor. So Paul claims his innocence and he believes that the best outcome of his case can be made by appealing to the emperor in Rome to have his case tried before Roman authorities. Now, as I said to the class this morning uh, when we met earlier, you can't just appeal to the emperor about a parking ticket, any old thing, uh, some minor infraction of law that you're accused of. You can't you can't fill up the emperor's docket with uh, minor matters, and no governor would last in their office if they referred to the emperor cases that were of little concern or import. But here, Festus, after conferring with his council, with his advisors, decides that this appeal is legitimate, that it's a life and death matter, since the Jews from Jerusalem are asking for Paul's death. And so he says to Paul, you have appealed to the emperor, and so to the emperor you will go. It may be that Festus soon after regretted this decision that he made, because he discovers that he has to write a letter to the emperor justifying sending this prisoner to be heard and tried in the emperor's tribunal. And that letter has to contain a bill of charges against Paul that are serious enough to warrant the emperor being involved. And he doesn't have that list of charges. So it turns out that a few days later, King Herod Agrippa II, the grandson of Herod the Great, the son of Herod Agrippa I, who was the person who died in Acts chapter 12, and that story, he and his sister Bernice arrive. Now, if you used your commentary and looked up information on the internet, maybe, Wikipedia has really reasonably good articles on each of these people so that we can find out what is known about them. Uh, and if you were to uh, read those articles or do the research in your commentary, you probably found out that Bernice, the sister of King Herod Agrippa II, was therefore the daughter of Herod Agrippa I, and her brother here is King Agrippa II. They have been accused by other ancient writers of having an incestuous relationship. To cover those rumors and to deny them, she was briefly married to the king of Cilicia, if I remember what the article said. But then she quickly left him and returned to her brother and traveled with him. And now they have arrived at Caesarea and Herod Agrippa II is the king of this region. He has Roman approval. He is a Jew. They are both Jews and they know more about Judaism and its religion and beliefs than Festus does. And so since Bernice and Agrippa were going to stay several days in Caesarea, a beautiful place to stay by the sea, Festus laid his case, Paul's case, before Agrippa and Bernice, saying there is a man here who was left in prison by Felix. When I was in Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me about him and asked for a sentence, and likely a sentence of death against Paul. But I told them I was not, it was not the custom of the Romans 
to hand over anyone who had been accused before the accusers had an opportunity to have a face-to-face -face trial with their accusers and to make their defense against these charges. And so they came up to Caesarea, Paul uh, Festus is saying to Agrippa, how Luke got this information is not known to anybody. Is he making it up? Is he fabricating what is reasonable to have occurred? We know that ancient historians did that if they had no direct access to a source. And this is a very private kind of conversation, it seems, between Festus and Agrippa II. Luke may have heard about it from somebody else who was present, but again, he may also have created this dialogue as a reasonable uh, set of conversations, events that happened prior to Paul's trial later on in this chapter. And so Festus says that uh, they had given, uh, uh, he had given Paul an opportunity to answer the charges. And as soon as they came, Festus said, he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought in. But surprisingly, when the accusers stood up, they didn't charge Paul with what Festus was expecting. So apparently he only had the vaguest idea of what the charges were uh, when he told the authorities in Jerusalem that they should come up to Caesarea and state their case against Paul. He said, when the accusers stood up, they didn't charge him with the crimes that I was expecting. Instead, they had certain points of disagreement with him about their own religion, about their own law, which Festus knows almost nothing about. That's why he's asking Agrippa and Bernice, who are Jews, to hear this and provide him with more information. So they had certain points of disagreement about their law, about their religion, and we also now hear for the first time disagreements about a certain guy named Jesus who had died. We all know that. He was crucified on a Roman cross. There was plenty of historical evidence at this time for the existence of Jesus and for his crucifixion by the Romans. Well known. So that's not disputed. There was a certain Jesus who had died. What's disputed is that Paul asserted that he was alive. How ridiculous from a Roman point of view. So an argument broke out between the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin and Paul about the status of Jesus, whom Paul said rose from the dead, but the Sadducees don't believe in resurrection from the dead, even at the end of time, like the Pharisees did. So that was a further disagreement, but it's all a disagreement within the context of Jewish religion, within the context of first century Judaism. And so Festus says, I was at a loss as to how to investigate these questions. So I asked whether he wished to go to Jerusalem and be tried on the charges there. This is what Festus is telling Agrippa. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody, that is in protective custody, for the decision of his imperial majesty, the emperor in Rome, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to the emperor. So that's Festus's summary of Paul's situation in his conflict with the Jews from Jerusalem, this mainly Sadducees and mainly the high priest and the Sanhedrin, he summarizes that for Agrippa, and Agrippa says, this is interesting, I would like to hear the man for myself. Well, Festus says, no problem, tomorrow we, you will hear him. And so word got out. Now again, there's no internet or even newspapers. By word of mouth, it became well known in the city of Caesarea, that there was going to be a public trial in a place 
where many people could come, and that the king, Agrippa, and his consort, Bernice, would be there. And so the next day, it says, they entered the audience hall, a big space, with the military tribunes and the prominent people of the city. And they did so with great pomp. Now, pomp is the word used in the NRSV. The Greek word behind that is fantasia, which we get fantasy from. Uh, it's a word for decoration and embellishment and fine clothing and ornaments and jewels and uh, an entourage of people who were present to honor the king and Bernice and Festus himself who was only recently arrived and so the lots of the prominent people of the city dressed up for the occasion and were invited into the audience hall to hear this case against Paul who comes out in a likely a simple robe. He's so unlike in great contrast to the great contrast to the rest of the well-dressed and wealthy and powerful audience. And so this simple Christian man, Paul, a Jew, comes out and, and Festus orders him to be brought in. And before Paul can speak, Festus gives a speech which with, with which this chapter ends. And that speech says uh, to Agrippa and to all present, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish community petitioned me. Well, that's marginally true. It's certainly not true that all the Jews in Judea and Galilee were so worried about Paul that they petitioned Festus. In fact, there are many Jews who wanted nothing to do with this at all, didn't know anything about it, and others who were Christians, thousands who were Christians, who of course supported Paul, so they weren't a part of the petition. But you have to, I think, accept the fact that the Sanhedrin represented the people of Judaism at this time. And, if, and there was no one else to represent the interests of all the Jews except the council. Uh, and largely that meant the high priest who were appointed, uh, high priests were appointed by the Romans. And so they are representing the whole Jewish community. They brought charges against this person both in Jerusalem and here shouting that he ought not to live any longer. Well, this does remind you, of, doesn't it, of the accusations made against Jesus and the crowd shouting, crucify him, and so forth. Uh, and this, these parallels are pretty deliberate on Luke's part. He wants to show that the same things happened to Paul and the other apostles that also happened to Jesus. And so... Festus says to the king and to the whole audience that's gathered there, I found that he had done nothing deserving death. In fact, uh, Lysias, the tribune, who had brought the case originally from Jerusalem to Felix in an earlier chapter, had said not only had he done nothing deserving death, but not even imprisonment though now Paul has been in prison for over two years in Caesarea. What he did during that time, we don't know. Did he write Ephesians? Did he write Philippians? Uh, mostly people think those were written later on in when Paul was in Rome. But again, there's no direct evidence for that. And uh, some scholars do believe Paul wrote letters during this time, letters which we may not have. Colossians, Ephesians, and so forth, as well as Philippians. It seems likely that he would have continued to communicate with the churches that uh, he had visited previously. And he is certainly free to receive visitors and support uh, and to have had a secretary to dictate these letters too. So it's certainly possible Paul could have written letters uh, to the churches and the other Christians that he had previously known. 
But Festus says, I found he had done nothing deserving death. And when he appealed to his imperial majesty, that is to the emperor, I decided to send him. But I have a problem, Festus says. Since he doesn't deserve death, and I know that he hasn't deserved death, what am I to say that are the charges against him if I send him to the emperor? So far, all I know is that he has some religious disagreements about Judaism and about a guy named Jesus, and none of that's against Roman law. Apparently, he hasn't even desecrated the temple in Jerusalem, which he was accused of, but they haven't been able to prove any of this. So I have nothing definite to write to our sovereign, the emperor, about him. Therefore, no pressure, I brought him to you, before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, since you're a Jew and you know much more about Judaism than I do, so that after we have examined him, I think he has in mind that they'll ask Paul questions and seek to have evidence, maybe he'll incriminate himself if we give him an opportunity to speak. We'll find out what kind of rebel he is. And so we'll have something reasonable to charge him with as we send him on to Nero and the court of Nero. So that after we have examined him, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable and downright stupid if he wanted to keep his governorship and be in a good relationship with the Roman emperor, not to send him some prisoner without any bill of charges and a bill of charges that is about some trivial matter of differences among Jews about what they believe. That, that would be embarrassing. So he says, it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner without indicating the charges against him. Uh, and yes, very unreasonable and not a wise thing for Festus to do, especially since he's new in his role as the procurator. And so uh, the next chapter, <clears throat> we're going, in chapter 26, we'll deal with Paul's defense before Agrippa II. This will be the third and last time we will hear about the events surrounding Paul's so-called conversion on the road to Damascus. We had it narrated first in Acts chapter 9 by Luke, and then in Acts 22, Paul gave his own account of his encounter with the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. And now here in Acts 26, we'll have the third and final account of Paul's conversion and what it is that has motivated him to say what he does and why his opponents are so strongly opposed against him. So that's where our story is so far in Acts. Uh, we will finish it up in a few weeks. Uh, we have just three chapters to go, 26, 27, and 28. And then the Monday study group will decide uh, what it wants to do next. And uh, we've had several proposals so far, but some of you listening who plan to continue beyond this study of Acts, who would like to get the study questions and the videos about whatever our next topic is, uh, you may also want a voice in helping us decide what to do next. And so I do invite you uh, to email me. Uh, you have my email address when I send you the video and the study questions, so use that and email me to uh, suggest something that you would like to do. We'll probably get far more suggestions. I already have almost half a dozen, but I'm certainly willing and the group is willing to consider other ideas. So if you have an idea about what you would like to do next, um, and some of you are new to the Monday study group, and so you don't know what we've done before. Uh, uh, we've done a good bit of the New Testament and some of the Old, uh, but uh, and also other books of theology uh, and Christian uh, classics. So 
will see what the list contains this time. Send me your ideas, perhaps, of what you would like to do, uh, to have the group do and study and make videos about. Uh, and it doesn't matter how long it is. Uh, we've done long books. We've done short ones. <clears throat> we've done books of devotion and theology, as well as biblical material. So uh, let me know what you think. Thanks for being a part of the Monday study group and for participating uh, in the conversation. God bless you this week.